this is the largest daycare center in the world. It's wonderful that the place is crawling with children. Where else would you be able to get close to a moose like this? Only at a world-renowned institution dedicated to knowledge about humanity, the natural world, and the universe. We have this great library of life on Earth in our collections. A place where the American conservation movement was spearheaded by the museum's great patron. He saw the American Museum of Natural History as like the Harvard of the natural world. Home to the iconic habitat dioramas. Dioramas of this sort are really the, the lifeblood of a natural history museum. Step inside these time capsules with us. The first time I, I stepped inside a diorama, I was almost transcended. It's a great intellectual toy store, if, if you think about it, and it's just full, it's a fun house. This program is made possible through the generous support of Rosalind P. Walter, Judy and Josh Weston. And now, from the American Museum of Natural History, here's Tom Brokaw. For almost 150 years, the American Museum of Natural History, right here in the heart of New York City, has been a gift to the world. It is a treasure, for it is the story of life itself. Within these halls are millions of specimens, representing millions of years of evolution. The American Museum of Natural History, as many people know, does contain the largest collection of dinosaur bones of any place on Earth. But in every nook and cranny, there is something to be discovered. As a parent, I have always liked to bring my children and now my grandchildren here so they can press their faces against the glass of the dioramas and see the American West and the Great Plains where I was raised. Among the early patrons of the museum was our 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., whose legacy is tied to this museum. He was a passionate conservationist who wrote, we are not building this country of ours for a day. It is the last through the ages. So come along now on the ultimate field trip as we reimagine Teddy Roosevelt and rediscover this treasure of New York City and the world, the American Museum of Natural History. These second graders are embarking on an expedition. I wonder, are you guys excited to be here at the museum today? I think we're going to have a lot of fun, OK? So it's wonderful that the place is crawling with children. I've lived near it for a long time, and my kids were raised in that neighborhood. I remember on a rainy Saturday, once saying, you know, this, this is the largest daycare center in the world. They were like, it must have been hundreds of people with baby strollers and carriers going through the exhibits. All right, so why don't you guys follow me? We'll take a little bit of Headed a into the darkness to explore bison and beavers and bears. Right over there. And, but it, even on a sunny day, it, it's very crowded with kids and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's what is supposed to happen when a great landmark is used and connects to daily life and is not just a thing apart. The American Museum of Natural History, the largest such museum in the world, is also one of the world's most respected scientific institutions. Spanning four square city blocks comprised of 45 exhibition halls, the museum houses more than 32 million specimens and artifacts including thousands of fossils and dinosaur skeletons, minerals and meteorites, jellyfish, butterflies, and a 94-foot blue whale. It is also one of New York City's most beloved places. Almost everyone who grew up in the New York area remembers their first trip here. And what visitor can forget that first encounter with T-Rex or this eight-foot brown bear? How about those big claws? I think that would be very useful for getting food, for running uphill, and... Uh... It is a 1.6 million square foot treasure trove. We have this great library of life on Earth in our collections. It is perhaps the noisiest library in New York. This one's heavy. Everyone take one step back from the cart. I need all the room I can get. Awesome. So... Raise your hand if you know what part of the bear this is. It's a great intellectual toy store, 
if, if you think about it. And it's just full, it's a fun house. Over the past few years, the American Museum of Natural History, an institution devoted to collecting, studying, and conserving nature, has taken bold steps to conserve and modernize itself with the restoration of the Hall of North American Mammals and a new monument to the man considered to be the patriarch of the museum. During the next hour, we'll take you behind the glass to witness the restoration of these iconic dioramas. We'll go behind the scenes for a glimpse of museum specimens rarely seen by the public. And we'll introduce you to the American president whose devotion to wildlife conservation played an invaluable role in the museum's early days, whose vision lives on in these halls. Why do we have a statue of a president, President Roosevelt, why do we have his statue here in a science museum? Why do you think he would be in a science museum? Because he was a kind of scientist called a naturalist. Very good, because he was a naturalist. He was a scientist. And he loved exploring nature, just like I'm sure you guys, too. As these kids already seem to know, the soul of the institution is inseparable from one of its earliest supporters, Theodore Roosevelt. A taxidermist, a writer, explorer, rancher, politician, and our 26th president, an early and avid patron of the American Museum of Natural History, he is fondly referred to as our first conservation president. We've never had somebody like that in the White House whose great passion was the natural world. In an era when people were still very primitive on understanding the planet, Roosevelt saw Earth as one pulsing biological organism, that all of the rivers and the seas were connected into one, one thing. Born to a wealthy family in the Gramercy Park section of Manhattan, Teddy's parents were Theodore Roosevelt Sr. and Mitty Bullock. As a child suffering from debilitating asthma, Teddy Jr. was frequently housebound. There are no pictures of Theodore Roosevelt at the age of three or so. If there were, we would probably see a frightening little invalid of a boy because at the age of three, his doctors um, diagnosed that um, he would be very unlikely to live long. Somehow, miraculously, he got through to age six or seven when he began to read. Young Teddy devoured books and especially loved adventure stories about great animals. And this weedy little boy used to lug around a gigantic book of missionary travels by David Livingston. Accounts of Livingston's exotic and faraway adventures in Africa. Exciting tales filled with discovery and danger. So that's when his fascination with living animals began. It somehow was a complement to his weedy physical constitution. He fantasized a life of adventure, a life in the outdoors. I think that the, his love of nature was very much a desire to escape the narrowness of his aristocratic background and the narrowness of his chest and the narrowness of his ill health. Teddy became an avid collector of animals, bugs, birds, bats, squirrels. He learned the basics of taxidermy to preserve them all. Oh, he stuffed many specimens, yes, many specimens, birds and, uh, and animals, some of which he stuffed um, with a remarkable skill. He drew them beautifully, he wrote about them, in his notebooks, he logged every bit of his collection. By the age of nine, Teddy had published a short paper on the nature of insects, and his collection grew. And as a boy, he actually created what he called the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History. Created in his bedroom at his home on 20th Street. And it was there in the living room in 1869 that the original charter for the American Museum of Natural History would be signed. So this is the actual charter or copy of the charter to the museum. It's dated April 16th, 1869. One of the original founders of the museum 
was Theodore Roosevelt Sr., the father of the president and governor. So you have Theodore Roosevelt, you have J.P. Morgan, you have Joseph Choate, and these are the leaders uh, in New York City at that time, and they want a great museum of natural history in the city of New York, just as there is one in London, and they conceive of it very broadly, and they conceive of it with great ambition. It would become Young Teddy's playground. He would come down here, wander around, study. Uh, he saw the American Museum of Natural History as like the Harvard of, of the natural world. The museum encouraged in Teddy a lifelong devotion to both the institution and a personal passion for exploration and conservation. Roosevelt's legacy would eventually extend well beyond the museum and New York to all corners of America and ultimately to the White House. The American Museum of Natural History was first located in 1869 in a section of the Arsenal Building on Fifth Avenue. Two years later, the city of New York offered the museum a 19-acre parcel of land on Manhattan's rugged and undeveloped Upper West Side, from 77th Street to 81st between Columbus Avenue and Central Park West. The site of the museum actually predates Central Park because the, uh, it's an enormous uh, four block long square that actually was originally called Manhattan Square. Designed by architects Jacob Ray Mould and Calvert Vox, the master plan was to create a series of buildings that would fill the entire tract. It was an enormous, enormous building with courtyards and more wings and more courtyards and more wings and filled the bulk of that enormous four block site. In 1874, President Ulysses S. Grant laid the cornerstone for the first phase. That building opened to the public three years later. President Rutherford B. Hayes and Teddy Roosevelt in attendance. The original building still stands today, although it is almost entirely obscured by newer wings. Built slowly and in sections, the museum plan was continued with an extension to the first building, a grand entrance on West 77th Street in the style that we call Romanesque, or Richardsonian Romanesque, kind of American adaptation of Romanesque architecture. The rest of the castle would have to wait. The 77th Street entrance was completed at the end of the 19th century, a time when the museum was deep in debt. When the time came to resume construction, the 20th century was well underway and taste had changed. They were not so sure they wanted to build in that architectural style anymore. It, it felt too associated really with the 1880s in particular, which was very much its, its time. The museum wanted to go in a different direction. In 1924, five years after Theodore Roosevelt's death, New York State Governor Al Smith commissioned a memorial to the late president. A new museum building which would serve as the main entrance on Central Park West. The mandate to create a monument worthy of Theodore Roosevelt, the museum's greatest patron. To symbolize the scientific, educational, outdoor, and exploration aspects of Theodore Roosevelt's life, which would be harmonious with and embody the ideals, purposes, and plans of the museum to which Theodore Roosevelt devoted the early and closing years of his life. Roosevelt, the boy collector, had gone on to great things. This was a grand project, a grand architectural project to, dedicated to the memorializing a, a, grand, a grand person, our president, the governor of our state, um, as well as the former police commissioner. To find a grand architect, the state held a design competition. What we now see on Central Park West might have looked like this, or this. So it's the design winning the competition for the selection of an architect for the New York State Roosevelt Memorial. 
And that was John Russell Pope. Architect John Russell Pope, who would later design the National Gallery and the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. Pope is a maker of monuments as much as a maker of buildings. He loved sort of grandeur and grandiosity. And almost every door, almost every entry gate, almost every window. Pope's was a monumental task. In addition to designing the building, Pope designed the extensive plaza in front of the building facing Central Park, which is ringed with these bar relief of, of wildlife. The building was finally finished in 1936. Four years later, with the installation of a bronze equestrian statue by artist James Earl Fraser, the Theodore Roosevelt Memorial was complete. Meanwhile, on 81st Street, another wing of the museum was going up, a building that was designed to look beyond Earth and into the heavens. The Hayden Planetarium, designed by New York architects Samuel Trowbridge and Goodhue Livingston, was not as monumental as the Roosevelt Memorial. It had a modern deco feel. The 60-year-old museum was still evolving. I think we're very lucky that it evolved over a long time and in slightly different ways because it becomes sort of like a real city almost. You, you can feel the layers of time there. All the while, there was an evolution of another sort going on inside the museum. For me, dioramas of this sort are really the, the lifeblood of a natural history museum. There's, there's really no other way of putting it. The period between 1880 and 1930 is considered by naturalists to be the golden age of exploration for the museum. Under museum president Morris K. Jessup, the museum was affiliated with over 85 expeditions to five continents. At that time, remember, there were no jet aircraft. You had to steam from New York uh, by ship across the Atlantic over to London, where you outfitted your expedition, and then cruising from there through the Mediterranean, through the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, and then down to the east coast of Africa, land in uh, Mombasa, and at that time, I believe, the railroad existed from Mombasa to Nairobi. And then you were on foot, and you hired porters to carry all of your equipment. On these expeditions, which sometimes lasted years, explorers collected thousands of specimens. An enthusiastic American audience back home waited patiently to see what they had found. People at that time were fascinated, as they are today, by the world around them. But in order to have it, it had to be collected and brought home. Brought home because scientists had no way to record what they saw in the field. There was no really sophisticated motion pictures or wildlife photography or telephoto lenses where you could really study animals with film and then show those film and teach with it. Still, there was an urgency among the scientists to share what they knew. The natural history dioramas emerge out of a time when we first recognized that uh, we are losing uh, wilderness and losing wildlife. The Industrial Revolution was depleting natural resources and threatening whole species of animals. Thanks to the level of development we've enjoyed in the last couple of centuries, there are only small restricted places that are really large enough to preserve the flora and fauna at the level that you would want to see. Scientists at the museum decided the best way to stir up popular passion for saving wildlife and the environment was to recreate their own personal encounters with nature in a revolutionary new form called the diorama. 
The earliest dioramas in the museum weren't the big and charismatic animals like the elephants and the lions. They were small, domestic birds. Frank Chapman, considered the greatest ornithologist of his day, first introduced the idea of displaying bird specimens in what he called habitat groups. Chapman's primary attempt in developing those exhibits was to put an end to plume hunting, uh, destroying habitat, killing birds for fashion. And the medium to tell that story was the diorama. The feathers were being used by milliners and dressmakers in women's hats and clothing. He used those exhibits and featured places and species that were on the brink of extinction. And Chapman had pull. He appealed directly to his old friend and museum connection, President Theodore Roosevelt. In 1903, Roosevelt visited the island off Florida, which had been Chapman's model for the Pelican Habitat Group in the museum. Seeing the birds and their fragile existence in person, Roosevelt was moved to create the Pelican Island Bird Reservation. He would go on to create 50 more such refuges before he left office. As the scientists had hoped, the dioramas proved to be an effective teaching tool, and soon the displays were a hit with the public. The museum wanted more. In 1909, the museum hired taxidermist Carl Akeley. Akeley was also a sculptor, biologist, conservationist, and nature photographer. With this unique set of talents, Akeley revolutionized the field. Akeley studied sculpture as an artist and applied sculptural methods uh, to taxidermy. So his methods, when he was in the field, he would very carefully document uh, the animals and make what we refer to as death masks. So all of the detail, the face, the nose, shapes and forms of the head, then he would carefully skin and prepare the animal, sometimes making plaster impressions of limbs. And so once he was back to New York in the museum studio, he could recreate the form, the muscular form of the animal. These are called mounted. They're not stuffed animals. That's something you might have at home, right? These are not stuffed animals. People didn't stuff them full of cotton. Um, instead, they're mounted, so it's the skin and a layer of paper mache. Have you ever made paper mache, maybe in art class? Sure, we, we've all done that. Um, and it's actually very lightweight. You'd be surprised how light some of these animals are inside the diorama. This 1927 film shows Akeley's method of preserving an Asian elephant. In the museum, the dried animal skin is soaked for tanning and shaved down while a life-size form is built. Modeling clay is then applied over the form and skin is pulled over the form and fitted. Now, the elephant is encased in a plaster mold and separated into sections, which still hold the skin. The form and clay are removed and replaced with a layer of plaster. The skin and plaster inside combine to create a rigid form, only about a half an inch thick. The sections are reassembled. The taxidermist make adjustments and the animal is ready to exhibit. But doesn't it look real? Remember, we, we can use our imagination. Pretend for a second that we're not looking into a little museum diorama. Pretend we're looking out on Alaska. We're looking out on this whole environment and it almost comes to life, doesn't it? Beyond the animals, what makes these dioramas so striking is the faithfully detailed habitat recreations around them.
Our exhibits are not simply uh, an artist's imagining of what a typical habitat would be. The curator and the artist traveled on location and documented a real place and collected actual individual uh, animals. Fine art painters accompanied the expeditions and did plein air studies, literally painting outdoors to capture the exact colors and composition. All the plants and animals in the background paintings, the geology, the typical weather patterns, uh, the lighting systems duplicate specific time of day, whether dawn or dusk or brilliant midday. So every effort was made to duplicate an exact place in nature and those specific exact animals. Once back in New York, the painters got to work. We use old Renaissance methods for painting domed uh, cathedral ceilings or vaulted walls for plotting the scene on the curved, often compound curved background painting uh, and grid uh, a small sketch that's then transferred onto the full-size curve background. Painter James Perry Wilson perfected the method. Wilson uh, was a trained architect and applied his methods for plotting perspective, drawing architectural renderings, and plotting distortion on a two-dimensional surface to the creation of the background paintings. The uh, place in the, at the top right there with a circle just happens to be the visual center of the group. And it's also the eye level. Um, it's very important to uh, establish your eye level in these groups. Uh, from there, uh, he would then uh, develop a full charcoal drawing in value. Light and dark values are brighter in the foreground, and they, because they diminish with atmosphere, uh, become uh, less contrasty as they recede into the landscape. So you complete your full charcoal sketch uh, on the background, work out perspective value-wise, spray fix that, and then start uh, working in color over the top of that foundation. At this point, it looks quite abstract. You can see Perry just sort of putting those globs on there, and it, uh, you are very close. But if you did get back to the point where this is going to be uh, seen from, you'll find that it takes on a great deal of detail, and Perry's paintings probably look uh, more photographic than, than very many of the other background painters. It's an ingenious method that we still apply uh, today. It's really wonderful. The explorers in the field also collected samples to create the diorama's foregrounds, which often employed real plants and insects from the sites. Some scenes were dressed up with painted water surfaces and synthetic snow. So when you look at our African elephants or, or uh, the pronghorn antelope behind me, they don't uh, depict a typical example of the species. They, they depict an exact individual uh, documented in the field and recreated back here in New York. With the unique combination of these elements, vivid backgrounds, foregrounds you could almost touch, an extraordinary lifelike taxidermy, Carl Akeley made a kind of magic. Akeley was wonderful at um, uh, capturing a sense of arrested motion. In other words, the pose of an animal that really expressed uh, a certain motion or a certain attitude or mood. You know, the shambling uh, attitude of a bear versus uh, the regal proud look of a lion versus the statuesque, monumental presence of an African elephant. Akeley was really great at, at nailing all of those um, uh, characteristics or the gestalt of, a, of, of an animal. And although animals were killed to create these time capsules, Carl Akeley and conservationists of the day, that includes Teddy Roosevelt, felt the deaths were in the service of science and history. 
So Akeley sees the dioramas not only as a tool for conservation and urging for preservation, but he also sees the dioramas as quite possibly the last place where people may see some of these creatures and a, a last-ditch effort to preserve them. Eventually, the museum commissioned more than 250 dioramas between 1902 and 2007 and organize them in several halls throughout the vast building. It's such a unique art form at this intersection of art and science. I mean, they, their illusion, uh, because they're the work of an artist, uh, even the mounted specimens are artistic works, but they're, they're created with the discipline of science, so much so that they really depict an accurate uh, specimen in a real place. For all of their artistry, the dioramas can seem almost old-fashioned. They are decidedly anti-digital. But according to their stewards, their very existence here, real, not virtual, is the source of their power. They have a sense of scale and texture, impossible to replicate on a two-dimensional screen. The reason why people come to a natural history museum is in fact to see real things. Because it's only by confronting the real thing that you get a sense of, well, what's it like in the flesh, so to speak? What's its size? What does it really look like up, up, up close? By 2008, Close examination made it obvious that the dioramas were beginning to lose some of their luster. This hall was installed between 1935 and the mid-40s, originally. Most of the dioramas are of that, that age. Thanks to bleaching by UV, a lot of these mounts, these taxidermied mammals, look very tired. They, they'd lost their color. The problems of, uh, of heat and humidity were affecting them. The new hall of North American mammals is named for the family of Louis Bernard. The hall and I are pretty much of the same vintage. And I remember coming to this hall with my mother. Uh, and of course, I came with my children, taking the subway from Brooklyn when my son was two or three years old. And we always gravitated to this hall. And the more we looked at the hall, the more the magic of the hall worked upon us. He sees two conservation stories being told here. There's the TR conservation story of what he did for the wilderness in the United States. But there are also the conservation stories of our art artists and exhibitors who have conserved these dioramas and brought them back to life. It's extraordinary. It makes it very real to see an animal in a habitat that you could imagine walking into, if you could imagine just walking through the glass and being there in Wyoming or being there in Alaska. Taxidermist George Dante doesn't need to imagine walking through the glass. The first time I, I stepped inside a diorama, I was almost transcended. Uh, you know, I, I stood in there, and, and for a little while, I couldn't believe where I actually was, because these halls have been my very inspiration since I was a child. Dante had always wanted to be a taxidermist. And for him, these dioramas are sacred ground. Good taxidermy and great dioramas really invoke emotion. They, they open your mind to different ways of thinking, and they really educate in the, the greatest ways, because how, where else would you be able to get close to a moose like this? Dante is part of a team of taxidermists, conservators, and artists who work on the restoration of the dioramas, which are treated as works of art at the museum. They're sealed very well. Most of them, the only way to get inside of them is to pull the front glass. The minute you pull the glass off, that's when bad things happen. You can trip, uh, you can drop a tool. Uh, so great pains were taken to assure that they were not damaged. Carpenter Richard Weber built elaborate platforms for each diorama so that the conservators would not disturb the existing foregrounds. 
And to prevent bad things from happening, extra precautions are taken. I put on these moccasins because um, we found through the work that we've done that um, if you do need to put a foot onto the terrain of the, di of the diorama, um, that you really disrupt the surface the least if you're wearing deerskin moccasins. So um, that's what we wear when we need to enter. The first step is often a good cleaning. They're dirty. They're just ridiculously dusty. Um, and the paper has definitely degraded. If it's curled and I try to bend it back, it's, it cracks right away. So it's, it's quite fragile. But cleaning won't be enough for these faded brown bears. They need a makeover. This iconic diorama was created in 1942 with background painted by Belmore Brown and taxidermy by Robert Rockwell. It depicts a scene of the snow-covered Agalian pinnacles in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. I've wanted to be a taxidermist and follow in the footsteps of these men, Akeley, Clark, uh, Rockwell. So to be able to work on their pieces has been absolutely the most amazing dream come true. The museum borrowed three specimens from the Smithsonian Museum. Vintage bear skins, almost 100 years old. For me as a taxidermist, this is Christmas morning. It might as well be. <laughs> this is fun. They are the same age as the museum's brown bears. The borrowed bears are also Alaskan. Uh, I'm looking at the, the colors, just how rich the browns are in there. Basically, if you look at the, the mounts, they're very, very blonde all the way down the arms. And the arms of these bears are what really gets the darkest. Uh, this, is, this is really great reference. The colors are spectacular. They really are. Using the Smithsonian bears as a guide, Dante and Quinn mix colors and begin. I sprayed that, that ochre color on uh -huh. the top of the shoulders uh -huh. and brought it down into the chest, the top okay. of the chest a little bit. What do you think? I, th I think the head's starting to belong to the body. Good. That's always a good thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. So next would be to take the uh, that general body color and start flicking away at the, uh, the darks in the head. It took six months for Quinn, Dante, and their team to restore the bears, turning these blondes into the young brunettes that they had once been. Every member of the restoration team has a favorite. Conservator Julia Sabalski is fond of a squirrel. I particularly like the Kaibab squirrel diorama um, because that was one where we did so much work with the snow. The original snow made of cotton and plastic had yellowed over the years. The viewer is very close to that snow, so the the extent of the illusion it has to be, you know, it has to be very effective from a short distance. The conservation team came up with a ceramic fiber insulation material and sculpted several new winter foregrounds. It is the tiniest detail that brings these scenes to life. I uh, received in the mail um, a box with some uh, fresh <laughs> pronghorn antelope droppings. So now we are, can climb back into the diorama and deposit these uh, by the specimens and add another level of uh, realism uh, to the diorama. The job of preparing and dropping the droppings falls to Julia. These are the antelope droppings as they were collected. Um, and they're actually 
in pretty good shape. They're not very crumbly or anything, but because they're going to be in the diorama for a long time, um, it's a good idea to consolidate them to give them a little bit of extra strength. Um, so we're using a uh, stable adhesive that's in a very dilute solution with acetone, and then we'll let them dry, and they'll be ready to install in the diorama. We referenced a number of photographs that were that were taken um, by trackers who were who are out and. Um, basically trying to understand how to tell pronghorn droppings from other types of droppings. And so those photographs are printed out and we are able to bring them into the diorama and use them to inform our arrangement. That's life at the museum, you know, that, that's sort of where else would you get really excited about the droppings. <laughs> or the moistness of a deer's nose, or the texture of Alaskan eelgrass, or the perfect color of fern. The team's passion for their work is obvious as is their unflinching attention to detail. Now what I'm doing is we have to replace the whiskers on the female jaguar. I've already done it for the male. So uh, the best material to use is the, uh, the hairs from these African porcupines. So what I'm doing is I've actually taken one of the whiskers from the jaguar and I'm just trying to go through these to find the right diameter hair that is gonna resemble the whisker the best. It's gonna clean his eye and paint his bill. Yeah, it's amazing, this is just dry color. You just brush it into the structure of the feather and it restores the color. Well, it just um, binds to the barbules of the feathers. My technique is using um, a relatively tiny brush to work very locally so that wherever the paint is actually in good condition I'm not touching it um, and I'm trying to blend in my work um, in a very localized way. After two years with a team of five conservators, three artists, one taxidermist, interns and volunteers, the restoration of all 43 dioramas in the Hall of American Mammals was complete in the fall of 2012. I think of all the dioramas, the brown bear is the, really the museum icon in the hall. And to see it before and after, it's made such a difference being able to go in and restore it. It's just. Uh, We've uh, gone way beyond what I hoped we could do. How would you describe a diorama? What is a diorama? How would you define it and explain it? Yes. It's kind of a picture, of, like a three-dimensional picture of an animal and its natural habitat. Great descriptions. You guys are really good at this. I like to think that the fourth part of a diorama experience is us, is the people. Does a diorama work if no one's looking at it? No. Not really. It's a wonderful thing to think that these dioramas are actually going to continue into the foreseeable future, tell people about the natural world, including details that you're not going to get in any other way. You're certainly not going to get just by inspecting a television image of something like a wapiti or a mule deer or any of the other wonderful displays that we've got here. Today, the museum consists of 25 interconnected buildings an ever-evolving institution which is constantly maintained, refreshed, and reimagined. I mean, this is a scientific institution. It's got to be at the cutting edge. Science is always moving forward. Expeditions still go on, more than 100 a year, and there are 200 scientists working here 
to catalog and curate what gets collected in the field. And they're collecting today in very different ways than at the start, but they're collecting, they're observing, they're studying, they're organizing. For all that's on display in the museum's halls, there are thousands of specimens that the public doesn't get to see. Only a tiny fraction of the museum's dinosaur specimens, for example, are on exhibit. The remaining fossils and bones are in storage, behind the scenes, parts of stories that are yet to be told. These are three um, skeletons from Mongolia of oviraptorids, which are um, a group of small meat-eating dinosaurs very closely related to birds. There's a tyrannosaur tooth still in Matrix. These are tail spikes from Stegosaurus. 150 million years ago. And this is a chunk of Triceratops jaw with a couple of teeth sticking out. Modern expedition missions have expanded beyond the collection, examination, and discussion of physical specimens. Museum research is now published and disseminated around the world. And the visitor experience is made richer by the museum's constantly evolving digital offerings another way to engage a 21st century audience. A visit to this museum is very much active and even more interactive. And this is a very exciting moment because it really transforms what it means to be a museum in the 21st century. Can't find T-Rex? Well, there's an app for that. It can take place in your hand. In your, in your cell phone, it's a mobile application. It's anytime, anywhere learning, anytime, anywhere interacting with the museum itself. Still host to countless school field trips, the museum welcomes five million visitors every year. The museum also is an educational institution, training thousands of teachers each year. Yeah, lost position. Educators can earn a master's of teaching earth science here. Along the surface until there's some sort of boundary. And even a PhD in comparative biology. The museum's physical evolution is ongoing, simultaneously modernizing and preserving the institution. We've sort of been moving around the edges of the museum, and the first project was the Rose Center for Space and Earth, which of course was a fantastic looking forward modernization and taking on some of the most exciting questions about the universe beyond. And then we moved over to 77th Street and we did a complete historic restoration and preservation of the castle that sits over there. And in 2012, the Restore Dioramas, and the Reimagine Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Hall on Central Park West, relinking the president's legacy to the museum. Our conservation president, whose history is so tied in with the history of the museum, he's really part of the fabric of the institution and its origins. In addition to those 51 bird refuges, Roosevelt was also responsible for the creation of 150 national forests, five national parks, and four national game reserves. As president, he spearheaded wildlife preservation laws and designated 230 million acres of preserved wilderness. It is TR's story because if it had not been for him and what he did as the conservation president, I strongly suspect that these wilderness landscapes would no longer exist. Today, museum leaders are hoping to make this great man a little less monumental by taking him off the pedestal. We made the decision to create and commission a special sculpture of Roosevelt himself. Cast in bronze, the statue is modeled on a photo of T.R. in 1903 on a camping trip to Yosemite. Sculptor Ivan Schwartz had some extra help from a TR impersonator. You're getting a very special sneak peek of our Roosevelt sculpture. Um, only now just arrived in the hall, and I'm going to take the packing blanket off.
The statue invites visitors to sit next to the president and contemplate his crucial role in the American conservation movement, or to stick your finger in his ear. In the center of the hall is a newly installed bronze floor medallion bearing a famous Roosevelt quote. And read it from here so you can see. Read what it says. This is a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. There can be no greater issue than that of conserv conservation in this country. Surrounding the sculpture and medallion, a collection of Roosevelt artifacts. Even specimens that Roosevelt collected as a boy will be here on view in the hall. In addition to that, there are letters and manuscripts, a copy of, of Darwin's Origins of the Species, which he read when he was 10. And a snowy owl that Teddy preserved when he was just 12. Three. The new Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Hall was dedicated in October 2012 on Teddy Roosevelt's birthday. Along with the restoration of the mammal dioramas, the project took three years and cost $40 million. This project underscores and celebrates the connections among this museum, Theodore Roosevelt, and the field of environmental conservation. In attendance was TR's great-great-grandson, Theodore Roosevelt V. I think it's a great memorial and a great you know, reminder of the, of the connection between his conservation goals and, and the Museum of Natural History in their museum. And I know that he would have really enjoyed roaming these halls today. Seeing TR here in this hall makes me think Ars Longa Vita Brevis Est. Art is long, life is short. We're really proud to have been part of the reinstallation and reconceptualization of the Roosevelt Memorial for now and for future generations. Not just for present and future scientists, but for anyone engaged in our universe. There's only one way that any of this works, and that's through knowledge and understanding. It's so important to have people understand, but to do it in a way that makes them feel like they've got an investment, as they certainly do. In, in the way that the world runs. And at this museum, I think we try to do that. There are no heavy advocational messages here. What we want to have people do is to come in, see the beauty of everything that lives in this world, and develop that kind of consciousness. One of the things that happens is that you begin to discover that science is not for experts only that everybody can partake of it. You just have to have it brought to you in a way that makes it accessible and exciting. It is a museum for all of us. This was a museum that came from the age when uh, public buildings were expected to be grand and to be giving us, as the public, something almost noble. And you feel that all the way through it. Okay, so guys, I think we're out of time, but once again, thank you so much for visiting the museum. Show me thumbs up if you had fun. And particularly since it's so full of kids and always has been and I hope always will be, there's something kind of nice about reminding kids that, that's, that public architecture can create a sense of grandeur and can make everybody feel, you know, this was made for you. For you, your portal to the greater natural world. You come into the museum um, and you look through these windows out onto these sometimes distant and exotic areas, but oftentimes uh, wildlife and nature are close to us. And because of the grand way that they're presented, one can't help but feel um, an accountability for preserving what one is seeing uh, because of the beauty and the splendor. So they're great tools for uh, nurturing and appreciation and wonder of nature. It is fun to imagine, as his great-great-grandson does, Teddy Roosevelt roaming the halls of this museum today. What would he think about the dinosaur collection, or the Alaskan brown bears, or the generations of New Yorkers who hold this place so dear? We think he would be proud. With the restoration of the Roosevelt Memorial Hall 
and the constant evolution and conservation of the museum he loved, Roosevelt's legacy as our conservation president is not likely to be forgotten. I'm Tom Brokaw. Thanks for watching this treasure of New York. This program is made possible through the generous support of Rosalind P. Walter, Judy and Josh Weston,